Scorched Earth by Jonathan Crary. This is uh, the first part of chapter two. Technological truths already attained can only become practicable under the social relations of communism. That was, of course, a quotation from Karl Marx himself. With daily news of massive loss of Arctic sea ice, melting of glaciers in Greenland and Antarctica, and fires burning across the Siberian permafrost, it may seem irrelevant to note a more insignificant feature of the Earth's vanishing cryosphere. Located on the edge of Yosemite National Park in the Sierra Nevada mountains is the Leal Glacier, or what little is left of it. For many years, it was among the most visited of the several hundred glaciers once present in the contiguous or contiguous, con- contiguous 48 states. But in 2010, it was declared effectively dead. Now it consists of scattered patches of dwindling ice darkened by atmospheric soot. Here is not only the wreckage of a glacier, but the ruin of once influential, even unassailable assumptions about time, permanence or what is here to stay. The glacier was assigned its Euro-American name in the 1850s, following the violent expropriation of the Yosemite Valley from its indigenous inhabitants. For educated elites, whether in Europe or North America, the conjunction of the word Leal and glacier was a harmonious fit. By the middle of the 19th century, the Scottish geologist Charles Leal was widely known for his claim that significant geological changes occurred only over immense spans of time. Tremendous transformations of the earth had taken place, but slowly and imperceptibly through processes of erosion and sedimentation, taking far longer than the brief frame of recorded history. One illustration of Leal's gradualism were glaciers, which from the human point of view, seemed like eternal presences despite their imperceptibly slow movement. Leal acknowledged the periodic occurrence of violent and anomalous events such as volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, but believed they had little impact on the constancy of long-term processes. The work of James Hutton in the 1790s had introduced the influential notion of deep time, posing a temporal scale of the Earth's history so vast as to be sublimely incommensurable with human experience. Building on Hutton's work, Leal dramatized the inconceivable slowness with which the state of the Earth is modified from our perspective, even as he showed how the Earth never ceases being the theater of reiterated change, of slow but never-ending fluctuations. An intellectual and cultural framework emerged that positioned the terrestrial environment as passive and impervious to human intervention. In Leal's words, the aggregate force exerted by man is truly insignificant, and nature was no longer a significant actor from the standpoint of human history and social science. Economic modernization required the earth and its structures to become distanced and objectified, like a landscape painting to contemplate and study, but at the same time, its seemingly infinite reserve of resources had to remain directly accessible for exploitation and the acquisition of wealth. Leal did speculate that the Earth's atmosphere might grow warmer over tens of thousands of years into the future, but recent developments such as the disappearance of gigantic polar ice sheets within a human lifespan would have been unimaginable for him. Now, with ever upward revisions of climate warming rates, it becomes difficult to assume that anything is here to stay, except radioactive waste, microplastics, and forever chemicals. We are living amid the mounting consequences of believing human actions to be independent of the world which we are a part. But as long as we conceive of our task as the staving off of an impending planetary planetary catastrophe, planetary catastrophe, we fail to understand, as Walter Benjamin and many others have said, that the real catastrophe is the perpetuation of the way things are and have been, of all the forms of imperial violence, economic injustice, racial and sexual terror, and ecological ravagement. 
It's a moment when the continuities and habituations of the present need to be disrupted and when gradualism in political praxis is no longer an option. At this unique historical crossroads, the evocation of catastrophe is increasingly appropriated as a weapon of corporate and military power and their techno-modernist mouthpieces. Often, the same authorities who insist on the permanence of the global institutions and 24-7 networks of the digital age are also the ones posing global warming as a crisis so huge that the only solution is carbon capture geoengineering, requiring efforts on a scale much greater than the Manhattan Project. Together, these contradictory messages are a double bind that breeds paralysis and fatalism. In either of these scenarios, perpetual present of low-wage work, endless new devices and miniseries binge-watching, or military corporate management of planetary disaster, the future is presented as the maintenance of existing power relations, projections from which egalitarian forms of post-capitalism or eco-socialism are excluded. Despite such posturing, there are now far fewer grandiose characterizations of capitalism as indestructible, as a vampiric system periodically killed off only to rise again in some new guise. The cliché of capitalism's perpetual renewability is itself exhausted. With any luck, we've heard the last of the maxim once tirelessly repeated by academic postmodernists and others, that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. During the heyday of this sentiment, there were millions in the global south and elsewhere whose political imaginations were not so narrowly paralyzed. Several analyses in the wake of the crisis of 2008 argue that the game is nearly over. Capitalism has no more cards to play and there has been an inexorable erosion of value production. For example, the late Robert Kurtz maintained that the much vaunted shift beginning in the 1970s to an information economy led by service industries never came close to matching its hyperbolic characterizations and failed to inaugurate a new phase of accumulation. For Kurtz, the 2008 collapse was inseparable from the dominance of microelectronics and computing in the global economy. Capitalism, he showed, is fatally weakened when work and the time of work cease to be the main source and measure of wealth. As one, as, it, as one of his interviewers summarized, here begins the extermination of the golden egg hen of capitalism, labor. Capitalism approaches, approaches its exhaustion <coughs> when human productivity is not just augmented but technology by technology, but replaced by it. <coughs> For Wolfgang's streak, capitalism is in an advanced stage of disintegration and will eventually come apart under the weight of the daily disasters produced by social order and profound anomic disarray. He sees a terminal condition of entropic disorder in which society ceases to have stable institutions capable of protecting individuals from accidents and monstrosities of all sorts. Others emphasize external limits as markers of the inevitable collapse. Several years ago, David Grieber observed that capitalism as an engine of infinite expansion and accumulation cannot, by definition, continue in a finite world. Now that India and China are buying in as full players, it seems reasonable to assume that within 40 years at most, the system will hit its physical limits. Whatever we end up with at that point, it will not be a system of infinite expansion. It will not be capitalism. It will be something else. However, there is no guarantee that this something will be better. It might be considerably worse. As the impossibility of continued growth and accumulation becomes more obvious every month, many of the imaginaries of progress that accompanied the various metamorphoses of capitalism have faded away. For nearly 200 years, these had sustained delusional expectations that material and scientific advancement were moving forward or moving toward a future prosperity in which everyone would share. Now, one marker of terminal capitalism is the absence of any substantive or credible promises of a better future. Some have argued that as, as of the 1990s, a new kind of historical awareness, often labor, labeled presentism, has begun to displace the various futurisms of the preceding two centuries. Elements of presentism includes all the technological innovations designed to abolish time 
or function in real time, which privilege the now and foster the illusion of instantaneity and immediate availability. That every service or product should be accessible on demand presupposes a reality unmoored from spatial, material, or temporal constraints. A related feature is the use of computing for risk analyses, forecasts, and simulations, seeking to identify multiple outcomes and to minimize uncertainty, in a sense to occupy and neutralize the future before it occurs. For the dominant global powers, the only tolerable horizon of expectation is one that confirms and extends the imperatives of the present, in which the unforeseen and unpredictable have been minimized or eliminated. But it's possible to argue that presentism is nothing new and indeed can be affiliated with the many ways capitalism has shaped the experience of temporality. The French-Hungarian sociologist Joseph Gable in the 1960s described how capitalism depends on a negation of historical time and a positing of progress as a quantitative succession of present moments that maintains existing social and economic arrangements. The privileged system is considered as perfect and extra temporal and therefore as immune to radical or qualitative transformation. In a reified technocratic society, Gable wrote, history can never be understood as the expression of creativity and spontaneity. Consequently, the undeniable fact of change forces itself on this consciousness of immediacy as a catastrophe. Part of our current crisis is the indifferent acceptance of the now banalized notion that our future is being invented by a small number of powerful corporations. Decisions about what product lines will sustain profits and growth have effectively made these com companies into the official futurologists of our time, the regulators of our expectations. According to Webster's Dictionary, the first uses of the words futurology and futurologist occurred in 1946. It is not coincidental that this specialization came into play at the end of the war, amid a broken world to be overseen and reshaped by American military and economic superiority. To forestall or nullify divergent hopes for a future of disarmament and international cooperation, a pseudoscience emerged whose task was to define the contours of a near future that conformed to the needs and requirements of American corporations and their imperial ambitions. Although some of the fictions and exclusions of futurology go well back into the 19th century, 1946 is when the dominant articulations of collective expectations become restricted to official experts, think tanks, economic forecasters, and best-selling gurus. Of course, technocratic depictions of the future concocted by elites are hardly new, but for over a century, from Henry de St. Simon in the 1820s to Walter Rathenau after World War I, advocates of economic and social rationalization almost always imagined less oppressive forms of labor and mitigations of social inequality in their forward-looking visions. In the 1920s, H.G. Wells portrayed a future that included a democratic world federation, disarmament, universal education, and even some limits on private enterprise. However, the takeoff of post-war consumer society required a decisive delinking of the future from any imagination of transformed social relations. The future became inseparable from carefully tended projections of scientific and technological progress coinciding with a range of new tasks for post-war consumers, but in which existing political and economic hierarchies would remain fixed in place. In part, the arrival of the atomic age with its new forms of global terror and mass death had to be repackaged and domesticated into promises of increasing abundance and leisure, enabled by clean nuclear energy, automation, blinking IBM mainframes, and a host of other alleged advances. In the work of another science fiction writer, one sees how much had changed since Wells wrote in 1920. Arthur C. Clarke, by the late 1950s, was an early incarnation of the public futurologist with his best-selling nonfiction book, Profiles of the Future. Written between 1958 and 1961, much of it originally published in Playboy magazine, the book can stand for hundreds of parallel accounts in which the future pr is presented as a catalogue of disconnected scientific, medical, or technological innovations, but which tacitly confirm the immutability of the existing social order. 
For conservative sci-fi writers and futurists like Clark, the sources of radical change can only be quasi-theological. Events like the arrival of super-intelligent aliens or the evolution of human beings into a disembodied overmind. By the late 1970s, most of the sensational features of Clark's futurology and that of many of his contemporaries, circa 1960, such as colonies on Mars, speed of light travel, teleportation, or dolphins speaking English, give way to less exciting prognos prognostication that was little more than rhetorically inflated economic forecasting. Whether the book was called Future Shock, 1970, or Megatrends, 1982, the future soon became about outcomes, or more bluntly, the winners and losers in a post-industrial or information-based economy. The buzzwords then were decentralization, networks, nonlinear systems, and globalization. But behind the verbiage lay the anti-utopian forecast of a world in which everything was determined by the desultory metaphor metamorphoses of the free market. In the past decade, there has been a huge increase in such speculation on the near future, but almost exclusively in terms of specific technological innovations and their consequences for institutions and investors. The title of a recent book encapsulates the claustrophobic frame of futurology, the two-second advantage, how we succeed by anticipating the future. Of course, there were momentous challenges to the official, official futurist pronouncements, especially during the global upheavals of the 1960s and early 1970s. Equally significant were the events of 1989 to 91, although the suddenness with which they unfolded had different consequences. Now we can look back at the implosion of the Soviet Union as the onset of some of the influential here-to-stay narratives, the end of history and the arrival of a unipopular or unipolar planet of market democracies. It's easy to forget the contested stakes of those developments. The end of the Soviet Union and its hold over Eastern Europe occurred so unexpectedly that it opened a popular imagination to the idea that a seemingly unassailable facade of, po of political power might in fact conceal a flimsy house of cards. For leaders in the US and Western Europe, despite their gloating, this was nonetheless a dangerous exhibition in need of countervailing measures. The early 1990s were also a brief window when the end of the Cold War seemed surely to bring with it the promise of a peace dividend. Everywhere there were expectations that some of the massive resources expended on war making would be redirected elsewhere. It was as if a weight had been lifted off a collective social consciousness, igniting the rev revivifying hope that another kind of world was possible. A wounded capacity for utopian thought and praxis was, momentarily at least, brought back to life. For the managers of the new hegemon, hegemon in the West, expectations of actual peace dividends, in whatever form, had to be quickly nullified or diverted. Thus, anticipations of a more egalitarian, non-militarized society were displaced by a future conforming to neoliberal priorities. The availability of the World Wide Web in the early 1990s, framed by absurd claims about cyberspace and virtual reality, was pivotal in this operation of, of tranquilization. Alongside the celebration of globalization, the internet was hailed as the portal to a new age of connectedness and opportunity. And to ensure that the peace dividend was forgotten, the 1990s were marked by a new sequence of high-tech wars with calamitous U.S. military interventions in Kuwait, Iraq, Somalia, and Kosovo, Serbia. For those in the East, the apparent opportunity to build a socialist society free of bureaucratic authoritarianism was exhilarating, especially in the German Democratic Republic, but it was rapidly quashed. The brutality and callousness with which capitalist values were imposed in Russia seemingly overnight is recounted by numerous voices in Svetlana Alex. Alexevich's oral history secondhand time. They turned Russia into a Western junkyard full of worn out rags and expired medicines. The Soviet regime? It wasn't ideal, but it was better than what we have today. No one, no one was excessively rich or poor. There were no beggars or abandoned children. Old people could live on their pensions. They didn't have to collect bottles and food scraps off the street. 
My horrible Soviet upbringing taught me to think about people other than myself. Now, three decades later, the products, systems, and services which media and technology companies trumpet as forthcoming are confirmations of a vanished future. We are constantly updated about what we must buy and what it must be replaced as. It slips into uselessness. And implicitly, we are cautioned that to hope for anything beyond these cycles of consumption is pointless. With capitalism entering its terminal phase on a planet disfigured by neoliberal austerity and environmental collapse, there is no longer even the pretense that scientific and technical development is aligned with human purposive, purposiveness, I hate that word, or needs. The once fashionable but nonsensical predictions of a co-evolution in which humans and machines would gradually merge into hybrid entities have been abandoned by all but a few psychotic singularity cultists. As this book went to press, some of the most heavily publicized areas of techno-innovation included AI, robotics, neurosciences, augmented virtual reality, autonomous vehicles, nanotechnology, genomics, and the Internet of Things. IOT. Each of these topics could be considered individually, but together they convey a sense of the suffocating occupation of a world from which human agency and creativity has been deleted. The ongoing promotion of AI, robotics, and the IOT is a forlorn, forlorn announcement of the re relegation of humans as working and living beings to the periphery of technological systems and also for many into debt, hunger, illness, and impoverishment. The philosopher Gunther, An Gunther Anders, writing in the 1950s, outlined how the telos of modern technological culture was the installation of a world without us. He did not mean the disappearance of people, but rather the encroachment of autonomous systems that render obsolete any decision-making based on the needs of human communities. What distinguishes Anders' position from related critiques is his insistence that nuclear weapons, since their use in World War II, have become the paradigmatic technological object for their absolute efficiency, for their perpetual disclosure of the irrelevance and disposability of living beings, and for their utter remoteness from any claims on behalf of a human and natural world. The advent of 5G network singles or signals this irrelevance in the overwhelming preponderance of data flows between things rather than communication between people. That billions of machines are communicating with each other indicates the current emptiness of this verb and the degradation of its rich social etymology. The new speeds of streaming computing power between different devices and networks allow sensor equipped things to perform actions autonomously and the digital services used by people will be ceaselessly adjusting and updating their operations as feedback on behaviors as, as feedback on behaviors is processed. Such high computational speeds render hopelessly obsolete the time needed for reflective deliberation between human beings. We are getting closer to an actualization of the cybernetic paradigm described by the Ticken Collective as a radically new structuring of the subject, whether individual or collective. The aim is to hollow it out. It is no longer a matter of separating the subject from traditional exterior ties, as the liberal hypothesis has demanded, but of depriving the subject of all substance. Each person was to become a fleshless envelope, the locus of an infinite feedback loop. These innovations are usually presented to the public as the convenience of living and working in smart environments, where everything is done for you before you've even thought of it. This is exactly what is at stake, the dispossession of thought and the evaporation of what used to be understood as interiority and volition. Whether the AI-driven robotic Internet of Things is ever even partially realized is less important now than how its disclosure of human expendability contributes to demoralization and the crushing of hope. One awaits this future as one would await death. Luis Suarez Villa has outlined how 21st century corporations are transforming the whole of society into a vast experimental laboratory to drive the agenda of techno-capitalism, namely to conquer and colonize most every aspect of human existence and nature itself. He sees one of the current goals of corporate power as the management of mass consumption habits 
and the production of compliant individuals who conform to the priorities of corporate power. New advances in biopharmacology and neuromarketing are just some of the outcomes of this expanded field of experimentalism. If this sounds exaggerated, consider these words from the website of the Billionaires World Economic Forum. The fourth industrial revolution is the first where the tools of technology can become literally embedded within us and even purposefully change who we are at the level of, of our genetic makeup. It is completely conceivable that forms of radical human improvement will be available within a generation. This megalomaniacal, this megalomaniacal goal of integrating human biology with information technology is unlikely to proceed very far, but it's nonetheless revealing of the deranged ambitions propelling current corporate agendas. Philosopher Federico Campagna has described what is at stake in the radical disparity between living beings and increasingly powerful information networks. The record-shattering investments in big data systems and technology rest on the belief that there can't possibly be anything ontologically relevant that couldn't at least potentially be reduced to the serial units of the language of data. A living person who refuses or is incapable of this reduction, he writes, is instantly stripped of any legitimate claim to presence in the world. The new capabilities of AI and quantum comp computing are being developed for the sectors that benefit most from their deployment. Banking and finance, security and intelligence agencies, and the military. All these operate in data-rich environments and the processing power and speed with which risk analysis and automated decision-making can occur is essential to their success and global dominance. The installation of 5G networks is especially critical for the military's ambition of maintaining full-spectrum dominance by linking all of its land, sea, air, and satellite assets into a single intercommunicating assemblage. Anders's postulation of technologies that disperse or dispense with human beings is realized in the creation of great wealth without labor, in a military that plans electronic wars without soldiers, and in social media where bots far outnumber actual people. These tools, these tools are dependent on the plunder and theft of social wealth and natural resources, preventing them from ever being in the service of anything resembling a common good, other than the downloading of hours of video content in a millisecond. The expanded parameters of machine intelligence driving global finance and the autonomous war-making platforms of the, mil of the military make a mockery of the pious claims that AI will benefit human needs. Big data and AI will only intensify existing global inequalities and expedite the development of new weapons systems. There are some who worry that the touted capabilities of AI, 5G networks, and the Internet of Things will coalesce into a smoothly functioning panoptic arrangement of social control. But this is never going to happen. The reality will be a patchwork of competing and incompatible systems and components, resulting in defectiveness, breakdowns, and inefficiencies. The capitalist logic of continual disruption through planned obsolescence, ever greater technical complexity, cost cutting, and the rushed introduction of unneeded upgrades conflicts with the stability needed for the efficient functioning of authoritarian control. Fearful anticipations of a totalizing future of digital surveillance and regulation are not only exaggerated, but, but are an impediment to realizing how free we are, in fact, to refuse the mandates of empire and adopt alternate ways of living. According to the technocratic futurists of the mid-20th century, we should by now be thriving in gleaming, poverty-free cities connected by high-speed rail, surrounded by material abundance from automated factories and making vacations on Mars, or sorry, and taking vacations on Mars. Instead, we are living amid decay and fatal disrepair, jetliners crashing because of cutbacks on safety features, water systems poisoned, failing power grids, petrochemical plants exploding, sea level rise threatening nuclear reactors and much, el and much else. There are growing mountains of discarded and unrecyclable solar panels and wind turbines. Pedestrians killed by driverless vehicles because they behaved illogically. 
and the collapse of shoddily built edifices like the Ponte Mirandi in Genoa or the, Mi or the Miami condominium, presaging the inevitable crumbling of millions of other concrete structures as their internal steel elements corrode. In the words of the artist Robert Smithson, we are surrounded by evidence of a succession of man-made systems, mired in abandoned hopes. The internet complex now compounded by the internet of things struggles to conceal its fatal dependence on the rapidly deteriorating built world of industrial capitalism. Contrary to all the grand proposals, there never, there never will be significant restoration or replacement of all the now broken infrastructure elements put in place during the 20th century. Any effective imagination of a post-capitalist material culture must confront the inseparability of modern technology from the institutional formations of modern science. We are currently overwhelmed from all sides by rever reverential exaltations of science and of the unimpeachable authority of the scientists who will deliver, who will deliver us from the climate crisis. The absurdity of the sanctification of one of the primary agents of biosphere destruction, including global warming, is evident to many, but there is a strict prohibition on openly acknowledging it. Science, in its many powerful institutional manifestations, is now essentialized as an a priori source of truth, existing above economic interests or social determinations, and exempt from historical or ideological evaluation. It is the one remaining mirage of legitimacy behind which global capital continues its rampage of planetary looting and destruction. The marginal figures of the altruistic climatologist or oceanographer are foregrounded as camouflage for the structural complicity of most scientific research with corporate and military priorities. In the face of reactionary attacks on all forms of knowledge and learning, our response should not be a mindless celebration of a fairy tale account of science. Such cowardly obsequiousness of a obsequious ah. such cowardly obsequiousness is an anti intellectualism as damaging as the right wing embrace of ignorance. The voluminous and many-sided critique of the limits and failings of Western science has been rendered invisible and unmentionable. Contributors to this essential body of thought include some of the most discerning philosophers, scientists, feminists, activists, and social thinkers of the last hundred or more years. We're at a moment when the survival of life on our planet depends on reanimating this critique and recovering an unequivocal awareness of how most of the foundational paradigms of Western science have brought us to our current disastrous, poss disastrous, possibly terminal situation. Unlike many on the left, French theorist Jacques Matt had no such illusions in the early 1970s when he identified science as both servant and divinity of capitalism. He understood that science had become fully configured to be the study of me mechanisms of adaptation, which will assimilate human beings and nature into the structure of capitalism's productive activity. The full colonization of research by the military and corporations following World War II consummated the disappearance of meaningful distinctions between science and technology. Jean-François Jean Lyotard saw the unconstrained de development of capitalist technoscience as the final negation of the emancipatory project of modernity and the extinguishing of any illusions about the beneficent role of human reason. The scientific method had long since become dependent on technology for creating the artificial, deracinated objects on which the method could be deployed. Nature and human beings are reduced and homogenized into techno-scientific abstractions. Indeed, as early as the 1600s, Western science had become one of the most powerful discursive supports for racism, misogyny, and the genocidal colonial projects originating in Europe and then in North America. Alfred North Whitehead detailed some of the historical conditions for the rise of technoscience. He noted that the very nature of what previously had been thought of as science changed fundamentally in the 19th century. Scientific research became meaningful or valuable primarily for its potential to generate some application product or practical technique. 
The greatest invention of the 19th century, he wrote caustically, was the invention of the method of invention. Science defined itself not by principles, but through results. It became a storehouse of ideas for utilization, which clearly meant commercial profit-making applications. Whitehead noted the late 19th century emergence of the methods by which abstract knowledge could be connected with technology and with unending consequences of innovations. He singled out Germany as the country where the boundless possibilities of technological advance were first realized. Whitehead, presenting these observations in his 1925 Lowell Lectures at Harvard, was too genteel to state the obvious, that the method of invention was inseparable from the rise of industrial capitalism and its voracious requirements. The modern state capitalistication of science, which Whitehead, Max Weber, Helmuth Plesner, and others had identified by the 1920s, has clearly brought us to the edge of catastrophe and its ceaseless flood of utilizations. Currently, the shrill glorification of science is a desperate maneuver of, of obfuscation to forestall a wider recognition of the disastrous inseparability of Western science and capitalism while promoting the delusion that science will save us from its own calamitous accomplishments, notably the current unraveling of the Earth system. To take one of innumerable examples, the torrent of synthetic chemicals poisoning air, water, soil, oceans, and the bodies of every higher organism is certainly one of the most enduring accomplishments of capitalist technoscience. Scientists themselves, not just corporate executives, bear direct responsibility for the terminal wounding of living systems by plastics, herbicides, pesticides, and petrochemical fertilizers as well as for the toxic impact of the 120,000 compounds increasing every month that saturate ourselves and the environment. These compounds have been produced for no other purpose than the vacillating of manufacturing and technical processes, including military applications, and for enhancing in thousands of ways the unnecessary conveniences of daily life and commerce. The global industrial complex is dependent on a continual stream of new products and is structurally incapable of limiting or, or regulating itself in any meaningful way. The actuality of a world made into a terminal waste dump by techno-science is not an anomaly that could have been or might yet be put right. It is intrinsic to the operations of scorched earth capitalism. When one considers the harmful innovations of synthetic biology, nanotechnology, social robotics, and autonomous weapons systems, to name just a few other areas, the knee-jerk veneration of science can only be understood as a capitulation to the ongoing assault on the life world. For philosopher Jean-Pierre Dupuy, anyone who believes that science and technology will manage to provide a solution to problems created by science and technology does not believe in the reality of the future.